Today we'll talk about the second fundamental theorem of calculus, which states that if f is continuous on a, b, then the definite integral of a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, where this capital F prime of x is equal to f of x. So what this says is that f of x is the antiderivative of f of x. So what we have to do is we have to find the antiderivative of the upper limit and we subtract the antiderivative of the lower limit. So this is the fundamental theorem of calculus number two. I am going to prove this on the last slide and I will say that the proof is uh, pretty complicated. If you don't remember anything from Calculus 1, you should probably pause the video and quickly review the mean value theorem, so that way when I do get to the proof, you understand what is going on. Anyhow, let's do some examples. Let's take the integral from 0 to 1 of x dx. So, what is the antiderivative of x? Well, to get x, what we do is we pretend there's a 1 up here, and what we do is we add 1 to it. So this is x to the 2. And then we divide by the power. So this is x to the 2 over 2. And in fact, if you take the derivative of 1 half x squared, you should see that the derivative is quite obviously x so you can just double check really quick by taking the derivative. And what we do is we use this notation, the bar that says we're taking it from 0 to 1. So what we do is we plug in 1 where x is and we subtract where 0 is in the x's. So this is just going to be 1 half. And again, if we draw a graph of this, so this is my x, y axis, this is 1, we know it's equal to 1 here, so we have this area here, which is a triangle, that's 1 half base times height, well, that's 1 half times 1 times 1, which is equal to 1 half, so there's proof that this works geometrically. Let's do an example a little bit easier, because that's what we need. Uh, e to the x dx, well, this shouldn't be too bad. What is the antiderivative of e to the x? Well, the derivative of e to the x is itself, so clearly the antiderivative must be itself. So this is e to the x from 2 to 3. So this is e to the 3 minus e to the 2. And that is all there is to it. You are done. That's pretty straightforward. What about sine x dx? You should try this one yourself before I do it. But if you can't figure it out, well, the derivative of cosine of x is equal to negative sine x. So it must be that the derivative of negative cosine of x is equal to sine x. So this means that it is negative cosine of x from 0 to pi. So when we plug this in, we get negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of 0. So this is plus cosine of 0. So this is negative negative 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2. In fact, if we take a graph of this, it's always nice to see what's going on. We know that a sine wave looks like this, where this is our pi, this is our 2 pi. So the area is this right here. So this area is 2. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you think this area is right here? Well, it should be semi-obvious that it is going to be negative 2. Why negative? Because area is signed with integrals. And this is a nice 
not really necessarily symmetric function, but the peaks and valleys, they're, they're cyclical. So the derivative, I mean, the area of the top is just the negative area of the bottom for half of its period. Anyhow, let's do one that you might have forgotten. dx over 1 plus x squared. This is the most important inverse trig antiderivative, and this is actually the inverse of tan or arctan of x. If you take the derivative of arctan, you get 1 over 1 plus x squared. Don't be fooled by the dx taking the 1's position. This is really the same thing as saying 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. I just happen to write the dx on top. And this is evaluated from 0 to 1. So we have the inverse tan of 1 minus the inverse tan or arctan of 0. And you can leave it like this if you want, or you can solve it and get a proper answer, but I'll just leave it like this. Probably good review if you figure out what these values are, but it's not necessary. Now, I'll do the proof. So those were all the examples. I don't want to quite do a bunch yet because we still haven't gone over the antiderivative laws, which we'll do next time when we introduce indefinite integrals. But I want to prove to you that the fundamental theorem of calculus 2 works. So this is going to be a little bit challenging. So hopefully you'll be able to follow along with this. Okay. So first, we know that the integral from a to b of f of x dx is a Riemann sum. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of i equals 1 to n of x f of x i star multiplied by delta x, which we're going to rewrite as the difference between two arbitrary points, x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. And what this really is, is the limit as n goes to infinity of sigma of i equals 1 to n of the derivative of some function times the difference between two points. So we're just letting f prime of x equal to f of x, and we're just substituting that in there. Okay, now what do we know about the mean value theorem. This is something you probably forgot, but what this says is that the derivative f of x i star is going to equal the right side of an endpoint minus the left side of the endpoint. Uh, this should be f of x i minus 1 over the delta x, which just happens to be x i minus x i minus 1. So you should probably review the mean value theorem if you can. If you don't understand this, I'm sorry, this is a calculus 1 thing. I do have a whole video on this, so you can go check it out if you've forgotten. And now what we can do is we can, I forgot a star here, we can just take the denominator on the right side and move it over to the left side. So we have f prime of x i star times x sub i minus x sub i minus 1 is equal to f of x i minus f of x i minus 1. Okay, now this is a little bit interesting. Because we know from this that, well, on the right side, this, well, on the left side here, in fact, I will underline it. If we take the limit of this as this goes to infinity, 
then we get a definite integral. So what we have here is we have the limit on the right side as n goes to infinity. Again, what we do is we take the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of both sides. So when we do this on the right side, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of f of xi minus f of x i minus 1. So I'm going to put some brackets around here. Now at this point, well, we know what the left hand side is if we take the limit as n goes to infinity and the sum i equals 1 to n of the left hand side. And this is going to equal the sum of the right hand side. Now what does the right hand side actually say? Now I, I should probably break this apart. What this does is it takes the right hand endpoint and it subtracts the left hand endpoint. So if this is x i and this is x i minus 1, it adds the right and subtracts the left. But then the next iteration, when it goes to x of i minus 2, it adds the right one and subtracts the first one. So we get a bunch of adding and subtracting all the way down until we get to x1, where we just subtract x1. But all of these other ones are being canceled to 0, because we add and subtract them. So what we have is we have the addition of the last interval and we subtract the first interval. So this is equal to f of xn minus f of x1. Or sorry, I should say this is f of x0 if we're being proper here. All right, we just have one more step. We know that xn is our last value and x0 is our first value. So this really just is f of b minus f of a. So we have proven through this long complicated line here that this, in fact, here's what we have. We have a definition of the definite integral. So this is a definite integral. This is the Riemann sum description. Then what we do is, by mean value theorem, we find that this right here, which is the Riemann sum, eventually reduces to this picture right here. And we've shown this by equivalence using the mean value theorem. We know that the Riemann sum is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from 1 to n of this f of xi minus f of xi minus 1. And using this picture, we expand all the terms and get left with this formula right here, which we know is just the final point minus the first point, which happens to be f of b minus f of a. Therefore, this formula is equivalent to the Riemann sum, which we know is equal to the definite integral from a to b. So this proof was a little bit complicated, a little bit sort of unintuitive at first if I were to say prove the fundamental theorem of calculus part two without knowing anything prior, you probably would not be able to. But Hopefully this made sense. If you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comments and I'll get to you as quickly as possible because this can be tricky. It's not super important to understand technically, but mathematically you should sort of see where this is coming from. Anyways, as always, comments, leave them in the section below. And hope you guys have a good day because next time we're going to start indefinite integrals which will be a little bit lighter of a topic.